Good evening. Welcome to the Leyland Library. Welcome especially to our friends from Tewksbury. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear me? Uh oh. Can you there? Anyway, we are excited to be here with Hunter Cheney from the Sometimes American. It says something yeah, about it. Um, and um, if you are joining us on Zoom, feel free to put a question in the chat. We're also recording this session, so you'll get it in your email. And I'll get out of the way and hand it over. There. All right. Oh, oh, hello, everyone in the World Wide Web. I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Hunter Cheney, and I am the The host unmuted you. We've had a little, little bit of uh, technological difficulties. As you can imagine, this always happens in, in yeah. instances. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about this extraordinary uh, educational nonprofit foundation and this new museum that opened up in 2019. Uh, so we'll start with the, the next slide, please. There we go. So the, the picture that you see there is of our uh, historic aircraft hangar. So this is where we started the restoration on a very rare World War II bomber aircraft called the B-24 Liberator. So this is one of the first aircraft that the Collings Foundation started to restore that put us on a long adventure. And next slide, please. And so uh, we started out um, in 1979 as an educational foundation, as a 501c3. The goal, kind of the purpose of the foundation is, of course, the, the preservation and exhibition of very rare major historical artifacts. And we call them major because we're talking about planes and tanks, uh, large machines. And we also specialize in the uh, organization of living history events. The, the ultimate goal really is we strive to create learning moments, uh, learning environments that not only engage people in what they're seeing, but we we design things to motivate people to want to learn more. And so we started out, uh, Bob and Caroline Collings started the Collings Foundation uh, in 1979 again. And this is really where it started. Um, Bob and Caroline started collecting these early American classic cars, really beautiful um, cars such as the Accord, the Duesenbergs, Rolls Royces, Packards and Chryslers. And at that point, next slide, please. At that point, we started to do these living history events around the cars, ice cutting festivals, sleigh rides, mostly like turn of the century living history events. And it quickly morphed into when we started to restore historic aircraft. So here's another picture of some of our car collection. This is the Sprint and Midget collection in the hangar that features 1920s and 1930s um, uh, race cars. And um, so next slide, please. And uh, so in the early 80s, we started to restore World War II historic aircraft. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the first one was the B-24 Liberator. And then soon after that came a B-17 Flying Fortress and a B-25 Mitchell. These are World War II uh, fighter and bomber aircraft. Uh, and uh, so once we restored these aircraft, uh, we came up with this idea. Um, go ahead and, and next slide, please. To start to tour these aircraft around the country. So we had this uh, Wings of Freedom tour. So think of this tour as like a interactive flying memorial, next slide please, for World War II veterans. And um, so each year we bounce around the country visiting about 110 cities across the United States. And in each city, when we land, 
We open the planes up. People have a chance to tour through these aircraft, and we take people flying in the planes. It's such a, a unique experience. It's something you never forget. And uh, so we started this tour around the country. And for 30 years, we've been touring these planes around, visiting about four and a half million people annually. Next slide, please. And as we, as we tour around the country, we continue to collect very rare historic operational aircraft to the point that the Collings Foundation operates one of the world's largest collections of historical aircraft. And here is a good example of one of our living history events. This is a, a picture of an event called the Race of the Century, where we highlight the chronological advancements in transportation technologies from uh, the early 1800s all the way up to the 1940s through a series of competing races. And so, uh, next slide, please. So as we're, we're touring around the country, we continue to collect these really rare historic aircraft, uh, such as this one, which is a Grum and Goose, with a, two cars you see in front of it is a, a Auburn Cord, and just behind that is a V-16 Cadillac. That Cadillac was actually owned by um, Al Capone, of all people. So he owned this Cadillac, uh, this is one of two that he owned when he got out of Alcatraz. And it's a running car. We actually bring it out in June for a special living history event. Next slide, please. Interaction. The, the living history experience is something that we really impress on people. And so here's a good example of this where we have one of our docents engage an audience in a uh, Panzerfaust, which is a kind of a German rocket propelled uh, grenade in our hangar. Uh, next slide, please. So here's another picture inside the hangar. Uh, at our grounds here in Stowe. So you can see some of our aircraft are there. We actually have 39 flying aircraft total. Uh, and this is just a small sampling of the aircraft that we have uh, in the foundation. And these planes actually take off and land on the property there in Stowe. We have a 2,200 foot airstrip. So this is the, these are the Wings of Freedom Tour aircraft. So on the foreground is a P-51 Mustang. It's, it's a rare uh, P-51D, which is the only, or one of the very few that has a full set of dual controls in it. Just behind that is a B-24 Liberator. This is the last fully restored flying B-24J Liberator in the world, which is pretty amazing considering that in World War II, this is the most mass produced aircraft in American history. So imagine at the height of production during World War II, uh, one aircraft was made every hour. It's a phenomenal feat of industrial ingenuity. Uh, and this is the last one uh, flying. Just behind that is a B-17 Flying Fortress. And then the far uh, side is the B-25 Mitchell. You might recognize that type of aircraft. It's the same type of plane that Jimmy Doolittle flew during that daring Doolittle raid. Next slide, please. So we'll run through a couple of the, the aircraft we have, and then we'll get to the American Heritage Museum. So here we have a picture of a PT-17 Stearman. This is a World War II trainer aircraft. Next slide, please. Here we have a F4U 5NL Corsair. It's a, a World War II and Korea era fighter aircraft. And just behind that is our second P-51. And this is a C model. This is the only C model, again, with a set of full dual controls in it. Next slide, please. 
This is a, uh, a P-40 Warhawk. Uh, this is also a two-seat uh, fighter aircraft. Next slide, please. Here we have a, a Hellcat fighter, very successful fighter during World War II, particularly in the Pacific theater. And next slide. This is an FM2 Wildcat. And uh, you see in that, uh, in the cockpit is Rob Collings, who is now the president of the American Heritage Museum and the son of the founders of the Collings Foundation, uh, Bob and Caroline Collings. Next slide, please. Of course, one of my favorite planes in our collection is this aircraft, which is a P-38 Lightning. Uh, this, the Lightning's actually uh, in the Worcester Airport right now. Uh, at least I believe it is. Worcester or New York, I'm not quite sure. Next slide. This is a very rare Spitfire. This is flown by two aces during World War II and has a, an incredible history behind this specific aircraft. And, and again, another one of my favorites. So as we get out of World War II and Korea, when it came to Vietnam and, and having uh, programs to honor our Vietnam veterans, specifically the pilots, we came up with the Vietnam Memorial Flight Collection. And here you see uh, two of those aircraft in the collection, which is on the forefront is the um, uh, Skyhawk, the A-4 Skyhawk. You might remember John McCain, uh, the senator who ran for president. He was flying in this plane and was shot down uh, over North Vietnam and uh, thrown into the Hualo prison, um, which is also known as the Hanoi Hilton, which we actually have two remaining cells uh, that held American captives um, that we've recreated inside the museum, which I'll talk to in a little bit. In the back is an F-4 Phantom Jet. This is the last flying civilian operated F-4 Phantom Jet in the world. Slide, please. Here's another picture of the, this awesome jet. So these, the Vietnam Air aircraft, we keep at Ellington Field in Houston, Texas. So this gentleman here, this is Jacques Littlefield. So as we take this Wings of Freedom tour, this World War II aircraft tour around the country every year, we always end up in California. And out in California lives Jacques Littlefield. So Jacques, in his lifetime, had amassed the world's largest privately held collection of tanks and armored vehicles. So imagine tucked away up in the hills of Portola Valley was building after building stuffed with tanks of all ilk and kind. We knew Jacques, of course, from his collection. And when the tour would land at the local airport in the Mountain View area of California, Moffett Airfield, we would invite Jacques down. Jacques. Come show off a, a tank with the aircraft. So we would have representation of the ground war and the air war of World War II. So this is how we got a nice relationship going with Jacques. He loved to come out. He really loved to fly in our planes and uh, show off his armor. And he, unfortunately, he passed away in 2009. And in 2013, his foundation and family had selected us to receive the entire collection of tanks. We're talking about roughly 240 tanks and armored vehicles. So here's a unique proposition. Here's a unique challenge for us as an educational foundation. What do you do with a bunch of tanks? How do we engage people in American history and the history of our veterans and military service and world history through a bunch of tanks? And this is when we came up with the concept of the American Heritage Museum. So here you see the front end of this new museum that opened up in 2019. 
So I'm sure all of you know what happened on the roll of 2019. COVID hit and the museum right after we opened, we basically closed down for a year plus during COVID and uh, just started going in, in 2022. And now in 2023, it still is very new, a very fresh museum. But I can tell you, it's one of the most extraordinary museums of this type in the world. Not, not necessarily through its collection itself, which is extremely rare. Um, some of the pieces are the only ones in the world that are left. The collection is, a, is really, truly rare and unique. But the way it's laid out, the narrative, the chronology of the museum is extraordinary. So here's one part of the museum. The museum itself is about 67,000 square feet. This side of the museum, you see World War II in Europe. And it uh, so we start when people come into the museum, you start in the main lobby where we have our earliest artifacts. Here we have a Revolutionary War era cannon, and then we go into a Civil War era deck uh, machine gun cannon. And then in the left corner is a recreation, a scale model of the first concept of a tank made in the 1400s by Leonardo da Vinci. So you can see his, his sketches in the back where he came up with this concept for one of his patrons. And uh, so we had recreated that um, to start off in this, this timeline that people go through as they walk through the museum. So after orientation theater, uh, where we run over the Revolutionary War and we go through the Civil War, the first thing that people go into is this immersive exhibit, uh, which is a World War I trench experience. It's a fully immersive exhibit, and it really kind of highlights what World War I trench warfare was like. Here's another shot of it with uh, shows a broader landscape of this particular immersive exhibit. And to the right, you see where we show the introduction of the tank into World War I. So that's an M1917 tank. It's an American built tank based off of the original French Renault FT tanks. So here's another look at this particular tank. And what's unique, not only about this tank, but most of the tanks that are in the museum, I'd say about half of the uh, 85 tanks and armor vehicles that we have, it's in running condition. So as we move out of World War I, of course, we go into another exhibit, which I find particularly important and poignant and relevant to today. And this exhibit is called War Clouds. This exhibit highlights the world order in the 1930s. So here we cover the rise of fascism through Europe, the Imperial Japanese going through China into the Pacific theater, the Treaty of Versailles and how Hitler found ways to go around that and eventually invade Czechoslovakia and Poland. And then, of course, with Japan going through China into the Pacific, the one decision that officially propels us into World War II, the attack on Pearl Harbor, plays out in this exhibit, and then it lets out onto the main floor. As people go out onto the main floor, the first thing that you see is our exhibit called Arsenal of Democracy. So this is an exhibit that highlights, um, in essence, the industrial ingenuity and uh, industrial might really of the United States during World War II. This is the, a model of the, the last type of uh, car that came off of Buick's line before they completely stopped making cars for civilians and changed their manufacturing solely towards 
the war effort by making tanks and uh, aircraft engines and aircraft. Here's a continuation of this exhibit. So as you look down below, again, this is a, uh, this highlights basically our ability, how we mass produce all these things. So this is like a, uh, a mock manufacturing floor for a Sherman tank. As you go out onto the main floor, next slide, please. Then of course, the first exhibits that you see are, are again in chronological order when we talk about the war in Europe. So we actually start in North Africa. All of these tanks, everything that people see, they're all original and um, they're all restored to their exact configurations, just how you would have seen them during that particular time in history. The, the vehicle on the left is a German 222. This is actually one of two that remain in the world. Next slide, please. Here's another picture of the Matilda and the M3 Lee. Next slide, please. There's another picture of the 222. This is used primarily in North Africa as like a assault and reconnaissance vehicle. So, yeah, and as we go onward, of course, the next thing that we do after our North African campaigns is the Allies push up into Italy. So here we have an exhibit on the Italian campaign. The, the one thing that's interesting about this specific exhibit is the tank you see here, the Stuart, the white star on it, that is the first tank that Jock Littlefield had acquired that started this tremendous collection of his. Then as we, as the Italian campaign is going on, we have to talk about the battles along the Eastern Front after Operation Barbarossa. And this is when Hitler decided that Russia was no longer an ally, but a, an adversary with whose space that Hitler wanted to occupy for Liebenstrom, which is of course living space for Germans, for the German empire. And so here we have uh, a German and Russian equipment that served uh, in the Eastern Front campaigns between Germany and Russia. This is a Stug III. This is a uh, basically mobile artillery, very rare uh, mobile artillery piece. Next slide, please. So as we move out of the um, the um, Battle of, the, of uh, Kursk and around the Eastern Front, then the Allied forces come down from the North during the world's largest amphibious assault, which of course is the Normandy landings. So here you see very iconic boat that uh, was part of the Norman, Normandy landings. This is a Higgins uh, landing craft. This is one of what we believe of about 12 that remain that actually were part of the Normandy landings. Continuing on with this D-Day exhibit, here are two British tanks, um, the Cromwell and the Churchill, um, two beautifully restored tanks, if, if you want to call them beautiful, <laughs> but they are meticulous inside and out. When we talk about the battle for the Atlantic, so supplying our allies was such an important part in World War II. And this is a unique um, piece of a Type 7 German U-boat. So what you're seeing here is actually the rear section of its conning tower. And this is where the submarine would put their guns on as a platform for guns. The, the submarine was, was well over 100 feet. And this, is, uh, this takes up a good space in the museum. So it's hard to imagine just how large this sub must have been. As we land in D-Day and we're moving so quickly through Europe towards Germany, the last major offensive that Germany puts up is during Battle of the Bulge. So of course we have an exhibit that highlights the equipment that was part of these battles. And uh, to the right you see is a jumbo Sherman. 
This is a very rare tank. There are only a couple of these in North America. And there we have also a half track, uh, part uh, wheeled and part tracked vehicle with, with machine guns on the back. And then of course we have a, a mortar tank um, that shoots uh, large mortar shells. And all of these participated in Battle of the Bulge. As we push through the bulge, and you get the chronology as we're as we're going through the museum. So we push through the bulge, we break out of that, and the next major natural obstacle before we get into the Ruhr Valley in Berlin is the crossing of the Rhine River. So here we have tanks uh, that were part of this campaign. As we cross the Rhine River. Now we're on the outskirts of Berlin and we have a Battle for Berlin exhibit. And that features primarily, of course, Russian and German equipment. So the aircraft you see here is an ME-109. It's one of uh, Germany's uh, most mass produced and most used fighter aircraft in World War II. Then we talk about the defense of the Reich. And here to the left, you see a German 88 cannon. This is a, a flat cannon with a, uh, a, a cannon that can fire a shell up to about 30,000 feet in the air. And uh, to just to the right of that, you see this long tube. That's actually an optical range finder called a Kommangerat, which is a, a German optical range finder. So this rangefinder, through an analog computing system, so we're talking about gears and springs, would the operators would find the targets flying overhead and then lock in their visual targets. And as they locked in the targets as they're moving across their uh, field of vision, that sends these calculations to each flat gun. So then the cannon operator hears a bell ring and would wheel the cannon around to a certain direction and angle. And then the shell would go into an, a device that would pre-program the shell to explode at a certain duration. And then they would fire these shells up into these allied bomber formations. And so you might remember you seeing these old films of these uh, World War II bombers flying over these targets with the puffs of black smoke everywhere. And that comes from this particular type of cannon. The 88s were used in most of the, the, the most lethal tanks that Germany had during the war, primarily the Panther and Tiger tanks. So of course we talk about the liberation of uh, Europe during World War II and specifically about the Holocaust and all of the concentration camps that were then liberated by Allied forces um, towards the end of the war. A very moving and compelling exhibit. So now we're moving on to the left side of the museum. So here uh, we start actually in the Pacific War of World War II. This is another mobile artillery piece from Japan. It's called a Horo. And amazingly, this is the last example of its type uh, anywhere in the world. They only made a small handful of these. This particular one was in the Philippines firing on a Marine base. And by the time that the Marines went out into the jungle and they had discovered this machine, the crew had abandoned it. And so it basically sat in the jungle for many years and then was brought to the United States and transferred to the Marine Museum where the Marine Museum has um, given this to us for a long-term loan. So it's a very special piece um, and it helps us talk a lot about the war in the Pacific. Same as this piece here, this is an LVTA-4. This is an amphibious landing vehicle, and this is a particularly important vehicle to the Pacific Theater 
because most of the, for instance, when the Marines were going from island to island through the Pacific theater, the one thing that was really holding the, uh, the troops up from getting onto the island were the reefs that were around each island. And so they came up with uh, armored vehicles like this, which basically propel themselves with their tracks. So you can kind of see the scoops on the tracks and they would go off these landing ships, be able to drive up over the coral reefs and onto the main island. It was a very important um, uh, piece of armor for the Marines during the Pacific War. Here's some of our aircraft that are in the Pacific theater. Uh, on the forefront is the Wildcat, a very successful fighter uh, during the um, uh, Pacific theater of World War II. And just behind that is the Hellcat. So this is another special fighter that we have. This is a P-40 Tomahawk, also known as a Warhawk. The, the reason why this plane, this particular plane is so special is that this is the last flying fighter that survived the attack on Pearl Harbor. So the, the plane was at Wheeler Field when Japan attacked. And it was, um, it was involved in a, a landing accident a couple weeks prior to um, Japan attacking, put in a hangar for repair, and the hangar collapsed around the plane, but it never actually fell on the aircraft. So it was saved um, and then um, brought back out into the field. And then another pilot took it out and was training in the aircraft. And unfortunately, he lost control of the plane and crashed in the hills of Hawaii. After his remains were, were taken, the plane sat really uh, in, in Hawaii uh, for many years, over 20. And then it was brought to California where restoration started on this aircraft. Two other P-40 airframes and parts came from other aircraft and were put into this plane to get it flying again. And it's, so it's a, the last flying fighter that came from Pearl Harbor. So now we're transitioning out of World War II and we go into the Korean War. Next slide, please. And uh, one interesting tank that we have, uh, interesting and, and uniquely decorated, is this Sherman tank. So uh, the thought was, as the United States was entering North Korea and um, getting ready for war, the Interior War Intelligence Department was doing research on North Korea and China. And of course, they uh, had discovered that a lot of the North Koreans and Chinese were following the Zodiac calendar and um, were a little bit on the superstitious side. And this happened to be the year of the tiger. And so the thought was that if they painted up these tanks to look like their fierce mythical uh, animals, that they wouldn't fire on the tank for sake of bad luck. Um, it didn't last too long. There were, we don't really know how many of these tanks were painted like this, um, but we do know that it was a short-lived campaign because as soon as the year rolled, it became year of the rabbit and you can't make a fierce looking rabbit. <laughs> Slide, please. Then as now we're progressing chronologically and we get into the Cold War. To the left, of course, the very iconic piece of the Cold War is a piece of the Berlin Wall. And behind that is a T-72 tank from Russia. You might recognize this tank um, because they're still using versions of this tank, more modern versions of this tank in Ukraine right now. Then we go on to the Vietnam War. And uh, uh, so here's two uh, pieces that we have in our Vietnam War exhibit. Um, to the left, you see is a Russian amphibious um, artillery. And to the right, you see is an American tank. Then we get into the Gulf War. 
Um, here you see a Scud missile and its launcher. Um, this is the only Scud missile in North America right now. And then the exhibit continues on where we have some other um, Gulf War era tanks on display. Then we move on to War on Terror to the present. And uh, there in front is, of course, a piece of one of the Trade Center buildings. And then we have a display and presentation uh, on two pilots, basically, um, that were they were in Washington, D.C. That's where their base was on 9-11. And they were tasked with finding Flight 93. And uh, the calculus was, because they didn't have time to do anything with their aircraft, but they knew that the plane was hijacked. And they knew that it was on its way back towards Washington, D.C., and they had come to the conclusion that the only way that they could stop this plane was to fly into it. And so Heather Penny and Mark Salisman uh, tells this really compelling story of what was going through their minds on that day. And that plays out in this exhibit. Also in this area too is the most modern tank we have in the collection. This is an M1A1 Abrams. This is one of two on public display in the world. Uh, this particular tank is special. And the reason for that is this tank was um, in the Iraq war in 2006, it was tasked with protecting the supply route between Fallujah and Ramadi, and uh, it hit an IED. And unfortunately, the commander of this tank had his head out the top of the turret, top of the hatch, and a piece of shrapnel came up and got him in the neck, and he was killed. When we discovered the history of this tank, we had found that the crew of this tank, uh, this, that uh, George's crew, George Uola, who was the commander who was killed, his crew was still alive. And we invited them up to talk about what happened on that day in 2006. Very compelling. And then it really is a heartfelt video presentation of how these guys have dealt with this through the rest of their lives. And it's really emblematic of what a lot of our veterans had gone through um, after experiencing such a traumatic thing such as this. And uh, again, a, a really um, uh, sad, sad presentation, but something that is a, a very clear reminder of what it means to actually serve in the military, particularly our combat veterans. So we're, we're so much more than just a static museum. Uh, most of, like I mentioned, most of this collection is operational. And um, a couple times through the course of the year, we bring the equipment out to do reenactments. And here is a good picture of uh, one of the tanks with a, uh, an explosion that happens during our World War II reenactment. While people explore around all these reenactors, they're portraying characters. And here we have Kelsey Cox, who's portraying a Rosie the Riveter. So when people come up to, to Kelsey, she shares the history of what it was like for women in the workforce uh, during World War II. Another part to this, and one of my favorite things, is during these reenactments, um, we often have the opportunity to have World War II veterans come and share their stories about what they had done during uh, World War II. And here we, we show a picture of bomber formations 
that uh, the fellow on the on the left is sitting on the left is Captain Bill Purple. He was a lead pilot in formations of this size. So he goes on to tell everyone about what it was like to lead formations of hundreds and hundreds of bombers over Europe. And it is just an incredible talk to listen to. Here's another picture of our one of our reenactments with a, a German tank being um, taken out by the Allies. And of course, the Germans surrendering at the end of the event. So uh, when we do our, our uh, living history events, again, our veterans come out and talk about what they were doing. And this is uh, another fellow, Alfred Consigli, who actually is going to, we have a, an event, our first living history event for this year is this weekend. It's a World War II tank demonstration weekend. Alfred will be there, which I'm particularly excited about. He's a, like most World War II veterans, there's a reason why we call him the greatest generation, and he still has it. Uh, he's 98 now, and he comes out, he was a gunner in the Sherman tanks. So he was in a Sherman tank from landing in Normandy all the way through Europe into the outskirts of Berlin. And he's got all these pictures of what he was doing during this time. So when you're seeing this tank, this Sherman tank, running around on the grounds, there's Alfred and he's saying, oh, I was in that tank. And he goes on this long and colorful story about what he was doing at all of 18 years old. Slide, please. This is another part to what we do at the museum. It, you know, we have a general saying is that if you read about history, you might remember it, but to experience something from history, you tend not to forget. And this is a good example of that. Here is a, uh, this is an M24 Chaffee tank. And so we have tank driving and instruction programs in these tanks. So if you ever, really wondered what it's like to drive a real genuine tank. We have these programs. So here um, we're doing a drive program. These are fully dual control tanks. So you have an instructor and we step you through the processes of learning how to drive these tanks in our tank movement area. So here's where we're loading up people to go in this ride and drive program. Um, the same sort of programs that people will be doing this weekend. So here on the right is the M4 Sherman, which is the only full dual control Sherman tank in the world. And then the M24 to the left. It's tanks are fun. We also love the, the aircraft and the cars. So like I mentioned before, a lot of the things that we have are all running, beautifully restored specimens. And here is a 1927 Rolls Royce, was actually built in Springfield, Massachusetts. And so we do this kind of a fun concourse d'elegance. It's like a fancy auto show behind a 1930s radio program. So as the cars come out, you hear about the history of the car, where it came from, but you also get a, a little slice of what it was like during the time that the car was manufactured. So you have advertisements, you have news bites and all these things that connect the car to the history. And it's just fascinating. And this is an event that we have in June over Father's Day weekend. Here's another car that we have as part of the American Elegance performance. And then of course, we have other events like Race of the Century. Here we have a 1909 Blerio, very old aircraft. Louis Blerio, of course, is a great French aviator, the first to cross the English Channel in a race in this famous type of aircraft. 
And to prove just how fast and, and unusual this plane is, it races against a horse. And this is what, what you see here is our race against a horse. Then we have, of course, a variety of reenactments and living history events. Here is, of course, a Civil War reenactment that we have. And then we have Revolutionary War reenactments, such as the one coming up in August, where we have a, a, a special living history event called um, Centuries of the Soldier, where we, we actually have uh, a chronological lineup of um, soldiers from as early as the Roman Legion all the way through uh, the Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War I into World War II, all the way up into Vietnam. So as you make your way down the airfield, you pass through all these camps. And as you, you go to these camps, the reenactors engage everyone in the life of a soldier, what it must have been like during that time. So we're continuing to expand and collect uh, to add to this phenomenal collection. And the plane you see here is a unique aircraft. This is a Waco aircraft. The reason why this is unique is that it was owned by um, Bob Tice, who was the first casualty of World War II, first American casualty. So he had a flying K&T flying service in Hawaii. And uh, this is one of his planes that he had owned. And he was out on the airfield checking his planes when uh, two Japanese fighters came in and strafed the field on the way to Pearl Harbor. And unfortunately, he was killed in that attack. And this is the aircraft that he operated. This is another aircraft that was just added to the American Heritage Museum. This is an SBD Dauntless. Uh, this came from the Pearl Harbor Museum. Amazingly, this plane sat on the bottom of Lake Michigan for 25 years. So it's really an exceptionally well-kept aircraft for being underwater for so long. Here you see the schematic drawings of our most recent exhibit that we opened up. So this is the exhibit called the Hanoi Hilton. Um, it's many of you might also know it as the Hua Lo prison. So during the Vietnam War, uh, the Hanoi Hilton was infamous for uh, being a prisoner of war camp that held uh, prisoners such as John McCain, Leo Thorsness, and Bud Day, and hundreds of others. And uh, we've reconstructed um, two of the remaining cells that held Americans in this exhibit, um, a very compelling exhibit that talks about the plight of the POW during the Vietnam War. And now, of course, I took this picture this morning. This is a M36 Jackson. So this is a World War II and Korea era tank that we just finished restoration on that will be part of our World War II tank demonstration weekend this weekend. I think that's fine. And that's it. <laughs> and so we've kind of run through the gamut of all of the collection here. The, the one thing that I encourage all of you to do is pull up our, our website, which is AmericanHeritageMuseum.org and look at the collection and I have, for each exhibit, there's a wonderful descriptions of each artifact that are in there and the exhibits themselves and what they represent. And we also uh, pull down our event schedule because every month starting this month, um, all the way through October, one weekend every month, we have these fantastic living history events. So coming up this weekend, of course, is our World War II tank demonstration weekend. Next month uh, in June, we have our American Elegance performance with the classic cars and classic aircraft. And then in July, we have another tank demonstration. August is the Centuries of the Soldiers event. And then September, we have a World War I aviation weekend where we fly the world's oldest 
uh, actually it's the America's oldest flying fighter aircraft, which is a Newport 28. So we pull this plane out and actually fly it, which is quite a sight. And then in October, of course, is our uh, last and largest event, which is the World War II reenactment on October 8th and 9th. I believe it's the 8th and 9th. Um, that's Columbus Day weekend. And of course, you can find all of this on, uh, on our website. I hope you've enjoyed this quick presentation out there in the internet land. And uh, are, there, are there any questions for me or? Yeah, there's a couple questions about the visitor experience. So someone commented that you should plan to spend two or three hours at least at this amazing museum. And another question about, um, is there a different admission for the airplane hangar or the main museum? I wonder if you could just give an overview. Yeah, so this the standard admission to the main American Heritage Museum is 20 for adults, 18 for seniors, and $10 for the kids, 12 and younger. Uh, toddlers uh, up to three years uh, are free. So that main building, the American Heritage Museum building, is open Wednesdays through Sundays, um, 10 o'clock until 5 o'clock. The classic car barn in the historic aircraft hangar, we open those museums up only during our special living history event weekends, primarily because we just don't have enough staff to, to do all three museums at once. So when we do these event weekends, that's the ideal time to come see those two additional museums. There's one question about how do you find people to maintain all these old planes and cars? <laughs> and so that is a really good question. Through all the years that we've been doing this, we've been very fortunate to um, come across the world's experts in restoration. And so we have these people that have worked with us for years and years, and we basically bring them in, they start restorations, and then we train people um, to do these restorations. But it's a very niche thing. Um, like, for instance, Dick Moran, who heads our shop and helps us maintain the tanks, he's been doing this for, oh God, 25 years now. I call him our chief tankologist. And all the volunteers that help Dick out, basically he recruits them from their expertise and he trains them on how to restore these things. Uh, and it's a very specialized thing. We, we solicit or pull specialists who know classic cars. We have special people that do restoration on the aircraft, both nationally and internationally, and the same for our tanks and armored vehicles. Um, but this is kind of one of the reasons how we got the Jacques Littlefield collection to start with is that we have such knowledge in the ability to maintain and restore these very rare historical artifacts um, that Jacques family felt if they can keep these planes flying, they can certainly keep these tanks moving. And uh, so that's kind of one of the, the real things that that were unique about in, in our museum, unique in uh, not only nationally, but internationally. Um, I have a question about yeah. provenance. You told the story of the tank who lost their captain. And how do you trace where a tank has been, what battles, and that kind of thing? In World War II, it's it's difficult. Um, we unless we have um, a serial number that's connected to a crew member that can recollect where that particular tank was. Um, it's there are mission reports that the U.S. military keeps where we can get a general idea as far as where tanks were at what time. Um, but without individual verification, it's pretty difficult. So we kind of can guesstimate on locations and, and um, historical, uh, you know, um, theaters that or, or missions that these tanks were on. Aircraft, it's, it's a little easier where you had a, a much more succinct record keeping of aircraft 
IDs, uh, the serial numbers of the aircraft to the, the squadrons that operated. And then the squadrons would have a very detailed log record of the missions they were flying. So aircraft is a little easier to trace uh, than tanks. With the automobiles, <coughs> same thing where uh, we can guess, um, but unless we have a individual verifying um, we can only, you know, just glean from our, our historical data. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Um, does anyone have any more questions? You're getting lots of bravos and thank yous. Good, good. It was a pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks you for everyone for coming tonight. Um, I put the link in the, in the chat for the museum and I'll definitely send it out via email as well. And I want to say thank you again to Hunter for joining us. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see you soon, maybe this weekend. <laughs> thank you. You bet. Bye.